Welcome to another edition of James Martell's Coffee Talk, where James, successful publisher, speaker, and author of Online Success for Non-Techies, talks frankly and openly with experts from within the Internet marketing industry about strategies and techniques you can use to develop a successful online presence for your personal or corporate brand. Here is your host, James Martell. Yes, and welcome to another edition of Coffee Talk. Today I'm speaking with Roy Weissman about learning to negotiate to get more of what you want. You'll learn why it's what you do before starting the negotiations that can have the biggest impact. Roy will be sharing key strategies and tactics to bring people together, to get people to eagerly talk to you, and to fully engage. Roy Weissman has spent a career in business development, sales, marketing, finance, and management in the media, entertainment, and digital media industries. He has negotiated millions of dollars of agreements with companies including Time Warner, AT&T, Verizon, Comcast, News Corp, Gunthy Renker, General Electric, Amazon, and many others including Jay Leno. After honing his expertise at companies including Viacom, General Electric, Playboy Enterprises, and one of the leading search engines of its time, InfoSeek, Roy transformed a 50-year-old company into a digital innovator as the first e-commerce B2B site in its segment, and he grew the business by more than doubling its margins prior to its sale. Roy teaches negotiations at Northeastern University as well as builds businesses online. Roy is an instructor here at the School of Internet Marketing and he lives in New York City with his wife Fran. Roy, thanks for joining me for Coffee Talk. Thank you, James. Enjoying to be here. Happy to be here. Now, I have to ask, and before we get into talking about negotiations, uh, and before we get into that, how are things today in uh, one of my very favorite cities, uh, New York, uh, the Big Apple? Well, it looks like we're getting a white Christmas, even though Christmas was two months ago. <laughs> They're having a little snow, but of course, in true New York fashion, it usually doesn't stick. So people make a big scene, we're going to have this huge storm, and then the next day you didn't even know we had snow. So it'll, we'll see if tomorrow we still have any, but it looks I'm, nice. For now. I'm, I'm always amazed that the snow will even make it down. Uh, I guess it must. And uh, you ever get out to Central Park when, when there's snow around? Sometimes, but we have a park right across from where we live, a, a different park, a much nice, a nice little park, but one of the boutique parks. So that's nice. So there's lots of parks in New York. You don't have to always get to Central Park, but Central Park is beautiful too. Always love that city. I've been there a couple times, as you know. We've had a chance to meet up, and it's uh, it's just a it's an exciting, vibrant, and uh, uh, as the as the song says, a city that never sleeps. And it is so true. And I always look forward to getting back out there. Let's talk about negotiations. You and I had a chance to talk about it a little bit in the School of Internet Marketing podcast, where you kind of gave us a flavor of what you are going to be covering in the course. Now, of course, today we're going to get into the meat of it. We're going to talk about and we're going to delve into these subjects that you covered and you're going to spill the beans, so to speak. I, I think uh, you would agree and give us some of the uh, more of the the rich detail that uh, I know uh, that you've got from our from the conversations that you and I've had on the side. So let's, let's just jump right into it. Do most people really know what they want when they enter into a negotiation? You know, as odd as that sounds, I would say no. And the reason I say no is I can't tell you how many people I've worked with at different times that will say, okay, here's what I want to do, blah, blah, blah. And then I'll start asking questions and I'll get a lot of, well, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, even, uh, you know, I always like to use the example of buying a car. People say, oh, I want to buy a car. I, I love this car. You know, I like a sporty car, whatever. Yet they never sit down and really think about what they really want and what their requirements would be. They never really sit down and say, okay, well, what do I want from a car? You know, how much do I have to spend? And what are the features or, or that I want in this car? Do I want a car? What am I going to use it for? Am I going to just drive it to the train station every week and commute someplace? Am I driving two hours a day? Am I driving fifty, you know, thousand miles a week? What am I using this car for? And wh- what do I want the car for? And yet, so many people run off to buy a car, and they're they're swayed by the beauty of the car, the emotions. And you know, one of the things you learn in negotiations is to always separate the emotions 
from the negotiation because as soon as you bring the emotion in, everything goes out the window. Kind of like going to the supermarket when you're hungry. Not the best time to be deciding what to put in your basket. And, and so a lot of people never sit down and say, what is my objective? What are my requirements? What do I want to accomplish with this negotiation? What in a perfect world, what would be the end point that I would say, wow, I accomplished my objective? How many people do that? Very few. And yet the ones that do do that, the ones that do understand what they're looking for and define clearly in their heads, maybe on paper in their heads, what they want, always have a much better outcome. I mean, it's the old story. If, if you don't know where you're going, how do you know you ever got there? What's the difference? And I know you talked about this a little bit uh, in, the previous, uh, in the previous session uh, What's the difference between bargaining uh, versus negotiations? Can you get into some depth on that one? Because I think there's a lot of confusion on that or a lot of misunderstandings around that. Well, you know, technically bargaining is part of negotiations. Yet I think of bargaining as a minor, almost non-existent part, <laughs> minuscule part of negotiations. Yet for most people, bargaining is negotiations. If, if you walk down the street, you know, stop 10 people and said define negotiations they most likely say oh you know negotiating for a price on something or getting the price down or or getting somebody to send something to me on time it would be very like one dimensional just the price and that's most people think most of the negotiation is the price and if i ask well when does the negotiation start they'd say well when i meet the person and i talk to them about what i want and I said, no, and what do you say? Well, I want to get 100 of these, and I don't want to pay $100. I want to pay $50. And they say, give me $75, and they say, sold. That's bargaining. That's just negotiating, negotiating over one variable in a one-dimensional kind of negotiation. Now, real negotiation, I don't want to say real, but the big picture of negotiations involves far more elements than the price. And actually, if you're really a master negotiator, the price as odd as this might sound, is a minor element of it. There are so many other elements of it being prepared. Most people believe most of the negotiation occurs, or virtually all of the negotiation occurs, at the discussion or the meeting or the phone call, whatever it is. The reality is master negotiators spend much more time outside of the negotiating, uh, outside of the actual session to do the, their negotiations. And And later in this call, we're going to talk about several negotiations that I did where I never asked for anything yet got the price up 50 percent that's the essence of a master negotiator being successful doing all the best practices correctly so bargaining could also be called haggling you go to a street fair or you go to a, a food stand you know a food a farmers market and someone says oh there's you can have 10 10 apples for a dollar and someone says, no, I, I, can I get 12? Could you throw in a few more? Okay, we'll throw it. That's just bargaining. That's just minor efforts. That's not negotiations. Negotiations is far more, a lot of negotiations is your preparation. Uh, uh, looking at, you know, what are you, you know, setting your requirements. People go to a fruit stand and say, I need fruit. They go to the stand and they say, give me the fruit. They never think about what their objective is. Now, that might sound a little silly. <laughs> well, I just wanted fruit, Roy. Why would I need an objective? But maybe your objective, you didn't think about, well, do you want fruit for the week? Do you want fruit? You're going to cook with the fruit? Do you, need, do you need anything else while you're there? You're going to need lettuce, tomato. You're going to have a salad. It's amazing when you actually sit down and think about, okay, if I'm going to the farmer's market, what else do I need or what else would I want or what are the things am I trying to accomplish? It might turn out you want fruit. You want salad. You might want some baked goods. You might see a bigger picture. Now when you go to the farmer's market and you get there, there might be two booths next to each other or a booth that has both salad and fruit. And maybe because you saw the bigger picture and they're selling the fruit on sale, you might be able to get a package put together that's the salad and the fruit for a better price overall because you did your homework up front. You thought about what you were doing. Another thing, when you go to a farmer's market, do you just go to one place or do you look around and get a sense of the market price for these goods? Or do you just go to some place where it looks good and say, let me get that? Do you ask people their preparation efforts, You know what their farm is like, where their farm is? I remember being in the watch business years ago 
and seeing we we're going to Hong Kong for the first time. We did a lot of research and I uncovered that there were 700 watch companies. Hmm. Do you believe that? Wow. 700 watch companies. So we literally got a computer program to fax all 700 to get feedback on their pricing and other stuff to get prepared. Well, come to find out, as we delve, d delve deeper and deeper into our research and our homework up front, there aren't 700 watch companies. There is a much smaller number of actual watch manufacturers. The bulk of those people are selling other people's watches, and they made up a name for their company because they figure that most people who don't live there have no idea that there's only a core group of companies. But if you don't do your research, you would know that you might go to Hong Kong and end up negotiating with one of these people thinking that they had a watch manufacturing operation. When in reality, they're just selling the watches from a guy you're about to meet in a half hour. So it's, you know, yet a lot of people go into a negotiation unprepared and just are bargaining. They're not negotiating. So let's let's dig into that then. The importance of of doing your homework. Obviously, this is a, a very key component of your strategy. So why is it important to do your homework? Well, we'll go back to the watch example. You know, when you're trying to buy watches and sell them on a wholesale basis, you're trying to find the best quality product at the best pricing. You know, that's going to consistent supply, dependable supply, so that you can build a business from that. And had we not, that was part of the reason why when it came, when we were talking about going to Hong Kong, I said, I want to know every company there. And we went online and we looked up all the online directories. We made an Excel list of every watch company we could come up with. And that's how we came up with these 700 companies, which was kind of insane. But we did it because I wanted to make sure we're covering every base. Now, why doing that homework was critical. Had we not done that homework, and we just went to Hong Kong and showed up at the trade fair. We would have had no idea that half the people at the trade fair aren't even manufacturers, that they're selling other people's things. So when you're buying some from somebody who's selling other people's watches, you're paying a premium. You're paying for a middleman that you may not need. So you're paying extra. And now when you buy those watches at a higher price, you're competing with other sellers who might be getting a better price. And therefore, they're going to be in a greater position of strength than you are when you try to price your product and sell it. So because we did that homework and because we learned about the 700 that were really maybe 50, I think maybe there were 50 manufacturers of that many out of 700 hmm. listed companies. You know, And of those 50, again, a core group were the ones you were interested in anyway because, again, certain – Manufacturing operations are geared to different styles and different types of watches. Some make analog, some make you know LCD. So you got it. When you start breaking it down, there's even less. But by doing all that homework, we had a better understanding of the lay of the land. We had a better understanding of of what was going on, and then we also went on a lot of appointments when we went there the first year just to hear what people said. Another example. A lot of times. You need to get something done around your house. Say it's, I don't know, some plumbing work or say it's a plumbing project for argument's sake. You want to have a vanity put in, in the bathroom or something. So people will go online. They call one person. How much is it? $200. Okay. I always call three or more people, three to five people. Why? Because if I have had no experience with installing that vanity or getting that plumbing project done, inevitably, when I call all those people, they all say something just a little different, and they all educate me as to what I need to know to make a decision as to how to do the vanity. And, and that's the key. You know, If you're not doing your homework, you would never find that out. People call one or two people, they get an estimate, they don't ask enough questions, and they don't find out, and they're really leaving a lot on the table. They don't know what to ask. And that's the key. Sometimes people say, well, I'm going into this thing. I don't know what to ask. You'd be amazed how if you call enough people, they teach you what to ask. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the information's all out there. It's just up to you if, if you use your head to get it. Sounds like a great way to um, quickly educate yourself and put you in a position where even if you don't really know the information thoroughly, at least you can sound like you're – coming from an educated perspective and I would imagine wouldn't you think that that would also uh, benefit you uh, in the negotiations absolutely you go to 
say you want to look for a car, right? A lot of people say, I'm going to buy a car. So you go to the Toyota dealer, whatever. How much is it? Everybody wants to know, how much is it? Who cares how much it is? What you really care is, what am I getting? Why would I buy that car? What do I want? You know, a lot of people are so busy. I, at one time, I was selling advertising in a national publication that went into a major hotel. And it was really funny because people would always, you call these people, how much is it? How much is it? And I used to say to them, how much is what? They'd say, well, you're selling the ad. What is it? Well, you never asked. You don't even know what you're getting. You want to know how much something is and you don't even know what you're getting. Because at the end of the day, something is only worth what someone's willing to pay for it. And that decision of how much you're willing to pay is based on a value equation. But if you haven't established the value, then something's worth zero. If I said to you, give me $500, the first question would be, give you $500 for what? <laughs> Just give it to me. Just give it to me. Forget for what. Just give me the $500. Who would do this? Okay. Give you 500 for what? Now, if I said, I can't believe this. I paid for a trip for two to Hawaii for a week at this really amazing hotel right on the beach. I, I, and I, between me and my wife, we we're going to go. It's a $5,000 trip right out of New York. We got the airline. The hotel includes all the food. And I tell you this whole story, and then I say, look, I got to get rid of it. It's going in two weeks. Can you give me $2,500 for it? Well, all of a sudden, I've now established this enormous value. And if somebody has time to go on vacation and wants to go on vacation, they might say, wow, well, I'll, I'll take it for twenty five. dollars I've established a value. But so many people go into negotiations, they don't establish value. How much is it? How much is it? That's all they want to know. How much is it? And, and it, it's meaningless. You know, you're going to go buy a car. You show up at the car dealer. The first thing people go, well, what do you have? How much is it? Does it have air conditioning? That's a real story to tell. What do you mean it's have air conditioning? It's got a lot more than air conditioning. A good salesperson, when you go to a dealership, will stop you dead in your tracks and start asking you questions about, well, what are you looking for in a car? They'll start asking you a lot of questions. Well, what, what car do you have now? What cars have you had before? What made you choose the Toyota dealer? Why you, why'd you choose this deal? They're trying to understand your perspective, and they're trying to help you do what you didn't do for yourself, trying to help you establish objectives and requirements. Because if they can establish your requirements and understand what you really want, you may not even know what you want, but once they help get it out of you and they put it on a piece of paper, now they can show you how they have the perfect thing for you. That's how to make it sound. You know what? In those dealings, People totally forget about the price. Then the price is only an issue of how much money do you have. It's never about getting the lowest deal because you're so excited that this individual has talked to you and better understood you. You're now excited. Yeah, we didn't even realize we could be driving it 4,000 miles a week and he suggested this other car because it's priced better and it comes with these other features. And, you know, that's, that's truly a negotiation because it doesn't feel like a negotiation. And, and some people think negotiation is adversarial. That's ridiculous. The best negotiations are collaborative, not adversarial. They're not the enemy. <laughs> you know, they're trying to help you get a car. Sure, they make money on it. Big deal. Why? If they didn't make money on it, they surely wouldn't be working there. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny you mentioned that because you're right. Anytime I walk into a car dealership, uh, and we just bought a, a vehicle for Arlene not too long ago, a little Toyota, sorry, a little Suzuki Grand Viterra. And I'm the guy that's avoiding the salesman. You, you know, it's because I do feel it's a little adversarial. So expand on that if you would. Well, unfortunately, you know, I should go into sales training because unfortunately so few people in, in certain positions have ever gotten any real training. They're just told, here's the job, here's the car, read the sticker and sell some. And they stand there like waiting for whatever to come through the door. Yeah, and I it's feel, like, you feel like you're prey when you walk exactly. in. Exactly. So, and unfortunately, the salespeople have the same intimidation of you that you have of them. Have you ever heard if you're lost in the woods and there's some vicious animal, you know, they're, just, they're as scared as you as you are of them? Yeah. The salespeople are just as scared of you as you are of them because they're worried they're not going to make any money. And they're living on a commission. A lot of these people are commission only. So they only survive if they get the prey for the day. And, and, and no one has trained them that they really don't have to knock the people down and, and bite their ear off to make any money. So 
admittedly, unfortunately, you go to a lot of these places and the people who have never been trained or who don't understand it, unfortunately, approach it like your prey. I have a, you know, it's funny because I haven't bought that many cars, but when I go to buy a car, I go in like a conversation. I go in, what have you got? Why would someone, I asked them a million questions. Why would <laughs> why, someone. Why am car? I not surprised? Oh, who would buy that? I ask people, who, what kind of people bought that car? Oh, well, families. Why family? Well, because the back seat is bigger and a lot of people have kids. And that's why it's 20% more. But if it's just, and then finally, after I asked them 100 questions, some of these people actually realized, geez, this person isn't so mean and rotten. They're actually a customer, and I can make money on them if I actually communicate with them in a civil fashion. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to be indict all car salesmen by any means. There's plenty of great people out there doing a great job. So I, I'm just saying, unfortunately, there are two as a percentage of the universe and the poor training and support that these people get at a lot of these dealerships, they don't have the skill set to understand how they could be 10 times more successful. Um, and, and that's the thing. I... You know, it's funny, years ago, I was leaving a job, and my boss said, you know, I want you to interview the people who are going to replace you and decide who you think I should see. And I'll never forget, this guy came in, and he had had a really good job at a major company, and it was a marketing research job in marketing research. And our office, I had worked at a radio station, and they kept this office like at 40 degrees in there. It was like snowing in there in the summer. It was so cold. This guy comes into my office, and he was so nervous. I don't know if you ever saw the movie Airplane. Mm -hmm. You know the scene where at one point he's so nervous the water is pouring off of him? Yeah. Like a, like a waterfall. This guy was sweating so bad his shirt was showing sweat. That's how nervous he was. Why he was right. nervous? You know, it was like crazy. And I finished the interview. I had to go for a walk. I was a wreck. I went for a walk. I'm thinking to myself, why am I upset? I didn't, I'm not interviewing. But it affects the other people. How how you behave affects the other people. So if the salesperson is relaxed and pleasant when you walk in, you're relaxed and pleasant. And it can work the other way around too. If you walk into a car dealership, you don't have to be intimidated with the salesperson. No one's forcing you to buy anything. There will be no guns held to anyone's head. You can actually come in and be friendly. And you'd be amazed how sometimes you'll relax them and they will behave better because you didn't come in like a customer. You just came in like a friend. You know, I was thinking of a Toyota. I have no idea what I'm doing. And you just have a friendly chat with them like you would with a friend. I, I think it changes the dynamic. You know, that's part of negotiations too. You know, the, the body language, the attitude, the demeanor. If you go into something paranoid, the other person's paranoid. If you go into something, some people think, well, I'm going to go into a negotiation and I'm not going to tell them anything. <laughs> so now imagine this. Your friend calls you on the phone and they say, uh, you want to go out Friday? Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'll see. Why are you going to see? I don't know. I can't tell you. And they act mysterious. Aren't you suspicious? Mm -hmm. You start wondering why they're acting so suspicious. Is it a surprise? No. Uh, I don't know. Have, have I done something wrong? Either you think you did something wrong or you think the person maybe has a, a tentative appointment with someone else and they don't want to they don't want to say no in case the other one falls through, but they don't want to say yeah. You figure something's up. If you behave that way in negotiations, the other guy behaves that way. I mean, this is it's very dynamic. You know, everybody thinks a negotiation is this this adversarial savvy you know, like a shark kind of environment. <laughs> if you want to be a shark, go ahead. They'll be a shark too. People don't realize the negotiation is like looking in the mirror. If you wear a green hat, they wear a green hat. If you don't want to say anything, they don't want to say anything. But it works the other way too. If you go in relaxed and friendly, they're relaxed and friendly. So, so what, you know, Go ahead. So I was just going to say, so let, let's talk about, because this is all very interesting. We've talked about bargaining versus negotiations, making sure you know what you want. You've talked about the importance of doing your homework and this whole idea, I guess, building a case, isn't it? That's what you're really talking about is, is building a case for, I guess, what they want. And in return, you're going to 
more than likely get what you want. It's just working together. It's collaborative. That's all it is. It's so simple. It's yet people think there's a big, mysterious, deep-seated meaning to that. The salesman just wants to sell your car. Some people think he's sitting there trying to find, charge you the highest price and stick it to you. Most people are not trying to do that. Most people want to look themselves in the mirror and be proud of what they do for work. They're not all trying to stick it to you. And, and it's not that they have a scam going. You know, on the other hand, part of the answer to avoiding getting stuck at two is what we talked about before, doing your homework. If I wanted to buy a car, say I wanted to buy a Toyota, I'd go to three Toyota dealers for the same reason that I said before. Find out what everybody says. Find out which ones, you know, I'm gonna, because I have no idea what I should be asking to buy a Toyota. I'm gonna let them teach me. And they're gonna do it for free, and they're gonna be very thorough. And then I'll meet three different salespeople and get three different environments and find out all the issues that I have to consider. And everybody will approach it just a little differently. And I'll become an expert at buying a Toyota, educated by the three dealers that I visit. So, so you, yeah, so I just want to fit it. So if you really want, if everybody's so busy being concerned, they're going to get scammed. They don't want to say anything. That's absurd. If you don't do your homework, you would deserve to be scammed. I don't mean that in a bad way. I'm just saying, if you don't do your homework, what do you expect? To get an A on the test? So how can, and you mentioned this earlier, how, how can someone get, uh, you know, how can you get someone to increase their offer without asking them? Well, it comes down to all the best practices we're going to cover in the course. I won't tell everything. Uh, I'll give, I'll, I'll just, basically, you know, the, the reason I was successful in two different occasions um, recently, in the last year, getting these offers expanded without me ever asking for anything. It's because I did my homework. I did my homework on who the other party is. I did my homework on the value. I, I established that value that we talked about before. I followed all the best practices in spades, and I kept emotion out of it. And in one negotiation in particular, it was a pretty significant negotiation, and I really wanted the money. <laughs> However, I also recognized that if I didn't follow my own rules, I was going to cost myself a lot of money. And it's really hard sometimes when you're doing these things, you feel like you should just say yes. You feel like, oh, I'll just say, okay, why can't I just ask for something? And it's hard. But if you have not established the value of what you're selling or what you're buying, uh, you're not going to be able to establish you're not going to be able to get them thinking in a value proposition. Remember, like I said, negotiations are like a mirror. The other party responds to your behavior. So if you're excited about what you're selling and you're, you talk about it, and you talk about that trip to Hawaii, how the hotel is amazing, and you were there before and you can't believe how close it is, the food was awesome. If I went on for 20 minutes about that Hawaii trip, I could sell it at cost. I might be able to sell it at a premium because somebody would be at the edge of the seat just falling out of their chair, ready to, oh, I got to go, whatever it costs. You know, funny part is, uh, you know, if you, if you look at auctions on eBay, people are overpaying for stuff on eBay because they get so excited about it, they're in the heat of the moment. And that's what the value proposition is. Are you getting the other party excited about what you're doing? And that's a, that coupled with a whole bunch of other things that I you know get into the best practices enabled me to establish myself in such a strong position of strength that at the end of the day the other person was willing to up their offer without me asking because I never had to ask because I demonstrated that it was worthwhile. So many of the listeners are already. Uh taking your course within the School of Internet Marketing. They're already partway through it and they're now listening to you. So they kind of got an idea what the course is about. Then there's others that are listening that haven't yet jumped into your course. So for the benefit of both, take us through what you're going to be talking about or what you're teaching in your course for negotiations. Well, there's six modules. Each one's about a half hour. And probably the most important part, well definitely the most important part of anything is the foundational concepts. And the first two modules are exactly that. What is negotiation and then the five key negotiation tactics that you need to use to be successful in negotiations. And those are very important. 
if you don't learn the basics, it's hard to move into more advanced territory. And don't skip through them. You know, when you listen to module one and module two, you might want to listen to it two or three times. Because what's really amazing, amazing to me, I mean, I teach a course at Northeastern, and it's ama it amazes me how people listen to the class, they hear what I say, and then they go and do a case study, and they totally forget everything I said. And they, they let emotions get in their way of decision making, they don't do their homework, and, and they're renegotiating the deal, and I say, why do you know who these people are? Did you check into what the options are? Did you find out what your alternative? No, they didn't do it. Then they don't follow it. And at the end of the day, if you don't follow the best practices, you're only cheating yourself. So the first two modules are the foundational concepts. And if you really want to be successful, you listen to those modules, you take good notes, and you follow it exactly as it tells you. And if you do what it says, you're almost guaranteed to do much better in your negotiations. And then the next two modules talk about negotiating for paid and free traffic. And again, talks about strategies and tactics to use. If, you are one, if you're one of the people that wants to do SEM, search engine marketing, and pay for traffic, whether it be cost per click, display advertising, whatever you want to do, I talk about some of the metrics. I talk about how to approach the different organizations. I talk about some of the questions to ask. And, and again, using negotiation best practices to really maximize your opportunity to get the best deals for yourself. And, and with a lot of these networks, there is nothing set in stone. You know, it's only limited to your willingness to ask questions. There are a lot of people that just figure, oh, if that's the price, that's what I pay. But at the end of the day, you might be surprised that when you talk to people and you follow what I teach in the class, how you can definitely reduce your costs and get a better return and even improve your execution. And both for paid and free traffic, free traffic obviously has more to do with you know, getting people to refer you traffic from different sources. And then, of course, we also talk about negotiating in Module 5, negotiating, negotiating partnerships and strategic alliances, which are obviously much bigger deals for yourself. Again, if you're not doing your best practices, you will never be able to, you rarely will be able to maximize your return on these partnerships. And, you know, the time to get the best deal is when you negotiate the first deal. Because once you negotiate the first deal, you've set the stage. So if you negotiate deal A and you only got X, and then two months later you realize you didn't ask for a whole bunch of other things, you're not going to get it. They don't, they've already got the deal with you. They're working on somebody else. So, again, understanding where you have the greatest position of strength is critical to being successful. And the best time to have the greatest position of strength is at the beginning when you're first negotiating because they have no deal with you. They have no relationship with you, so they really want it. And then finally in Module 6, I look at all the different tactics and strategies and I talk about how to help you understand you know, what's right for you. Some people are not sure whether they should be doing paid or free or how do they want to approach it. Should they be looking at strategic alliances? And I kind of try to put it all in perspective for everybody to help them get a better sense of what direction to take and help you get yourself together and have a plan. And, and I also, in all the modules, talk about, you know, ways to get started, what to try, and where to, you know, how to get your feet wet, to try to just getting something going and check it out and test it and see how it goes. Sounds like a, uh, a fabulous course. Roy, is there anything, any final thoughts uh, before we say goodbye? You know, it's funny. I think a lot of people think negotiations, oh, I know that. You know, it's like marketing, oh, I know that. <laughs> Yet, it may be how much you can learn and, and how much you don't realize you're leaving on the table. I, you know, when I had my watch business and I bought this company, a wholesale watch company, I was able to, in, in a short period of time, relatively short period of time, more than double the margins in that business from 22 to over 50%. And I did it by spending a lot of time understanding the audience, the customers, the markets, understanding what's going on, doing the homework. And it's no different in negotiations. You would be amazed at, at how much money you're probably leaving on the table, how much extra you're spending. How many, it's not just money, too, especially if you're negotiating with an ad network. So these people you talk to might know strategies and tactics that could get you far better return for, for a less cost per sale. But if you don't know what to ask and you don't know what to do, you miss that. And there's a lot of information out there that unless you learn how to approach things in a disciplined, consistent fashion, 
you, you leave a lot on the table. And I learned in the watch business, I was able to phenomenally increase my profits. And it's a lot more leverage when the same dollar makes you 50 cents than when it makes you 20 cents. That's a lot more leverage, a lot less work, and you make more money. And my goal in life is to work less and make more. And that's what negotiations is all about. Roy, thank you so much for joining me for Coffee Talk. Thank you, James. It's been wonderful. To learn more about James Martell, the School of Internet Marketing, and how you or someone on your staff can quickly and easily learn how to develop a successful online presence for your personal or corporate brand, visit theschoolofinternetmarketing.com. That's www.theschoolofinternetmarketing.com.